Doc, your first in line, yes, sir. So please, you get three camera angles. We want to stay seated or we want to stand. If you can do both. Yes. Okay, three minutes, sir. Please. Well, uh, welcome and, and thank you. I am Doug Richards, and I'm asking to be your next day representative. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out this morning. Uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your, uh, your day to hear uh, my vision for the New Washington and the 26th District. Uh, let me begin by sharing with you a brief bio uh, on who I am. Some of you in this room, obviously, I know personally. Some of you I don't know at all. Um, I uh, grew up in the area. I've been here for over 34 years. Uh, I'm currently living in Olala down uh, with my four kids and my wife, who's sitting right here at the table, and I appreciate her coming out this morning, and my daughter, who is my campaign manager, is sitting there. Uh, I uh, went to South Kitsap High School, graduated South Kitsap in 87, and when I got out of high school, I decided I'd join the Navy. Spent two years in the Navy, uh, serving on the USS Carl Vinson. Uh, got out of the Navy and wanted to continue in serving my community, and so I joined the fire service. I've been in the fire service for over 21 years now. I'm currently serving as a battalion chief with South Kitsap Fire Rescue. Uh, during that time, I also had a short stint in the U.S. Coast Guard Reserve over at Station Seattle. If you're familiar with where that is, I spent some time on a 44 UTV over there. Uh, you know, while I was a uh, firefighter, I also had a small business, and that's really where I got my, my teeth uh, cut on politics. I, I built homes in the community. I built about 30 over the last uh, 13 years, uh, everywhere from Fox Island to Seabed. And when I watched the uh, crisis of the housing market uh, in uh, 2008 occur, uh, I watched as friends, family, and uh, acquaintances in the building industry struggle through some significantly hard times, as you can imagine. And I watched as the state government uh, did very little to help the small business community in fact, in certain instances, created regulations, taxes, and fees that actually hurt the small business community and hindered those people from getting an opportunity to rebuild. And that's how I got my uh, start into uh, politics. Uh, as you're well aware, we ran last cycle, uh, and uh, we're running again this cycle because we believe that there is still much to do in Olympia. In fact, some of the same issues that I had talked about last cycle uh, are still relevant today. Last uh, cycle we were talking about job creation, and we've seen very little in this uh, community, in this uh, state, as we're sitting at about an 8.5% unemployment rate in the state, the un or the U6 rate, which is the underemployed and the unemployed, are hovering above 17%. As we looked at uh, our education system, uh, we are continually cutting to the education system, uh, the funding that we have, and we are watching as achievement gaps are growing and as uh, graduation rates are not increasing. And so as we need to, uh, that was a quick 30 seconds. Okay, 10 seconds. Oh, that's a 10 second marker, so I apologize. Thank you, and I'll talk to you more about it when I hear some of your questions. We'll give you two minutes at the end, Thank and I'll you. still do a wrap up. Thank you, Doug. All right, please. Thank you, good morning. I'm really pleased to see all of you folks come out, including my friends from Gay Harbor. Uh, I'm Larry Sequist, and I thought I would, I wrote my own question, the, the question that's been on my mind. Larry, why are you so fired up this year? Uh, I've actually been thinking about that question because, uh, as you know, I really enjoy politics. My wife and I are both political junkies. My wife, Carly, is a playwright and writer. And she just published a new book. She publishes commentary on Huffington Post and the Christian Science Monitor. As she says, she works at the intersection of politics, culture, and the American character. And for my part, I really enjoy both ends of local politics. I like the campaigns and the campaigning, and I love the legislative. Uh, on the campaign side, I go to everybody's debates. I go to the Tea Party political meetings. I go to the Republican women political meetings. I go to the meetings of my friends in Capo. If you've got a political meeting, make sure you go. That I know that you're being there because I'd like to join them. But it's more than just enjoying politics. I am now the chair of the House Higher Education Committee, and one of the things that really has been fired up this year is the overwhelming need for our state to become rapidly more educated. We've got, we are a state, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more because education is at the heart of this year's campaign. 
We have got to become a more educated state. As the chair, I spend nearly full time every day working around the state with our colleges and universities, with our students and faculty members on where we're going with higher education. But I'll tell you the things, the two things that have got me really fired up this year, the things that I realized when I answered my own question, is that I'm pissed. I am angry, I'm more angry politically than I've ever been in my life. And that's because I want to give you back, when I started life back on a farm, I was the oldest of five kids in a family that was part of the 1%, the bottom 1%. They, we were dirt poor farmers in Idaho. We finally collected enough nickels to buy a small farm in Oregon. And we knew two things. We knew that if you worked hard and got an education, you could make something of yourself. And that's no longer true. We look around this state, if you're a kid born into a poor family right now, the probability that you're going to get an education hasn't changed in 40 years. We can't survive that way. The other thing that makes me angry is the politics themselves. We knew when I was growing up that even if we had different political opinions, that we could all work together and solve the problems. That's not true now. Anger is the nature of our current politics. That pisses me off, and I want to see that change. <laughs> All right, good morning. So now that we're moving on to the next session, which is our question and an answer period, each candidate gets one minute to respond. We started with Doug as far as introduction, so let's start the question and answer period with Larry. Question says, from our survey, uh, <coughs> we're asked, each of you cites military service as a pre prerequisite for voting for you, okay? So what was the length of your initial illicit service contract and how much of that did you fulfill? Uh, my initial contract, I signed up for a six-year reserve contract. Uh, it was a two by two by two. You did two years of inactive duty, two years of active duty, and two years more of inactive duty. And as an enlisted reservist, after about 26, I listed on the 2nd of August 1962, went to OCS, I finished college, and then I went to OCS, got a commission, and so I finished my enlisted service the day I was commissioned into the Navy in November of 64. So I was enlisted about 27 months, something like that. Thank you. And, uh, I joined the military and uh, see what have been December 10th and 88, I joined in an ABC college program, which was a reservist status where you did two years active and then four, two years inactive and four years, uh, excuse me, two years active, two years um, inactive, and then four years on the inactive reserve list. I spent uh, uh, till September 10th of 1989 in the service, just short of two years in the service. Uh, when I got out, I was uh, released uh, from the Navy two months early because they were getting ready to leave on a Westpac, and I was released on a hardship to go back and take care of my family on some personal private issues uh, that were um, dear to uh, my family, so we dealt with those. Uh, and then I continued uh, after uh, getting back into the fire service to, with my enlisted, or excuse me, my reserve status duty by joining the U.S. Coast Guard. Thank you. And staying on the uh, military issue, since you both are familiar and have served our country, thank you. Uh, this candidate, uh, this audience member brings up a follow-up question, which is uh, both candidates are ex-Navy and 25% of all homeless are veterans. What policies will you implement to solve this atrocity? you, Doug. 25% homeless was the question. Uh, the question will, yes, it claims that 25% of all homeless are veterans. And what will you do to correct this? Well, obviously, uh, we both have a strong passion for the veteran community. And so my, my concern for the veteran homeless is that they have to have access to the resources available to them. Uh, unfortunately, I was in an event this past uh, spring in which uh, when I met with the veteran community in Bremerton at the Sheridan Park, many of them didn't even know the resources that were available to them. Didn't know uh, the dental, medical, 
uh, housing resources that were available in the community. So part of the issue is going to be making sure that we let every veteran know what is available to them out there in the community. And the second thing we need to do is to make sure that we get this economy moving again so that we can create the revenue streams to fully fund the programs that are out there. We see cuts from every type of program, from education to veterans benefits, and that's not acceptable. We need to fully fund those programs, and we can do that by increasing growth in the economy, getting our revenue streams back up, and fully funding those programs. Thank you. Back to military service, I put on your tables my DD-214 that describes how I met after I was commissioned in the military. I spent 30 years as an officer. Yes, two years ago, in this room, the Kitsap Sun asked Mr. Richard for his DD-214, wouldn't show it. The Tacoma News Tribune asked just a couple of weeks ago if all the candidates with military backgrounds would provide their DD-214s. I provided mine. I checked Friday. Mr. Richards, quote, has not responded to our repeated requests. We will continue to ask him. So my question about is, where is your DD-214, the whole thing? Uh, now, about homeless vets. And I can tell you the one I'm looking at is missing the bottom one. Now, the, the, about homeless vets, this is a very important thing. What we did over in Building 9 at Red Sox is create a homeless vet. We got the first one in the state, and we've got aggressive programs. I'm really concerned about these vets there. that are becoming homeless. I'm sorry. All right, so, okay, let's move this thing up a little bit more, shall we? Now, this, we talked a little bit about military careers. Let's talk about educational background. It says, question is, each of you went to college. We know that. Each of you claims bachelor's degree. Can you tell us about your college experiences? What city did you live during college? What did you study? Can you show us your diploma? And did you attend commencement ceremonies? So, Larry? Uh, yeah, I'm a graduate of Warwick State College. Uh, it took me seven years. I started in 56. During my junior year, left school, went to work for the Weather Bureau. First, I was a firefighter for about six months in the Front House Fire Department. I worked for a year as a, as a weather observer in the Arctic in an Eskimo village. Then I went to the South Pole for what was then known as the Weather Service and wintered over for 14 months with the Argentines, came back and finished up one year. So I graduated in 63 with a degree from Morgan State in general science and a certificate in meteorology. Thank you. And yes, I was pleased to go to that graduation ceremony. Uh, well, I'd like to just at least address the audience on that past issue with the, uh, the DD214. Uh, for some reason, my opponent wants to talk about 20 years ago, DD214, I sat here right before him last cycle. He had to look down and read it on the camera. You can go back to the last exit issue, said honorable discharge. For some reason, he wants to create this issue of some type of hidden thing going on in the Richards campaign. It's just truly not true. What's going on is he wants to avoid talking about the real issues of this district. He wants to avoid talking about the community. He wants to avoid talking about how he's raised taxes and fees 143 times. He wants to avoid talking about how he's increased spending $6 billion. Do I have a college degree? Yes, I do. I'm proud to say I got a college degree from Eastern Oregon University. Received it in 2009. I was an adult learner. I spent eight years getting that degree. Uh, I got it uh, through online learning, through the fire department, and uh, I am actually uh, was given a promotion based upon the idea that I completed my degree. So thank you. Perfect. So now, now we're on the issue of education. You all had an opportunity to share your personal backgrounds in education. And here come some uh, big questions regarding education for the state. For you, uh, starting with you, Doug, given the McClary decision, how do you propose to fully fund education? Simple. Uh, if you want to fully fund education, you have to prioritize it. What I mean by prioritize it, two years ago I stood before you and I said we need to fund education first, and we need to uh, create it before we start on the rest of the budget. Didn't get a lot of traction. In fact, my opponent called it a cheap trip. However, what I recognize is that now, just last week, my opponent repeated exactly what I said two years ago in an editorial interview. And it's just amazing that people come around to realizing that we're not prioritizing education. So what do we do? We fund it first. 
we created as a priority in the budget. Once it's funded to the level that we can all agree upon in legislature, then we move on to the rest of the budget and work the budget as a priority-based system, not just waiting to the last second to find out what's left to give to our kids. Kids come first. They have um, the important part of that is they have to be funded separately and first. If we can do that, I think that we can get ourselves out of the educational uh, hole that we're in. Thank you. So let's do the basic arithmetic. If you the court decision, this was a superior court decision that was then confirmed by the U.S. the state Supreme Court. And the state Supreme Court said you are radically underfunding K-12 basic education as defined in the state's constitution. And we think, I sit on a panel in Olympia that is trying to figure out where that money comes from, how much you need to get from here to 2018 when the court accepted the legislature's target for meeting the McCleary requirements. So here's the arithmetic. Right now, the legislature in January of next year will start about $800 million in the red. The McCleary decision alone requires another billion. So we're going to have to look around to find more than a billion dollars to put into K-12 coming up. That is not going to come out because you, quote, fund education first. You've got the health care costs, those kinds of problems to take care of at the same time. Thank you, Larry. Now, staying on the education issue, since we talked about uh, funding K-12, this is how about the other end of the spectrum. The question from my audience member is, with the rising cost for college going up 100% in the past six years, how do we stop the rising cost so our kids can stay in state school and, and stay in the state for school? Larry. Yeah, actually it's important to keep in mind that actually the total cost of going to state school hasn't fundamentally increased over the last several six, eight years. What's changed is the ratio between the state support and tuition. We used to pay about two-thirds of everybody's degree with state money. Tuition was one-third. It's now flipped over the recession caused by Wall Street trashing our economy. We have now only been able to afford about one-third of that tuition amount. What I'm looking for now are ways in which we can increase that. Thanks to my leadership in the House uh, uh, Higher Education Committee, I got another $124 million added to student aid uh, so that we're trying to change the ratio of how much we put in to that cost of an education. It's a very important problem. Thank you. Larry talks about his leadership in higher ed, and in the last six years, he's helped divert, excuse me, since 2008, last four years, he's helped divert a billion dollars from higher ed while sitting on the uh, higher ed. And so when he talks about leadership, he's failed. Why he's failed is because we are watching that in 2006, if you're going to the University of Washington, you paid just over $6,000 in new tuition. Now you're paying well over 12. That's a 100% increase. I don't know what math you're using, Larry, but that's way too much money for our hardworking families to afford to put kids through school. And while that was going on, Larry's uh, untied the hands and took in the tuition setting authority and handed it over to the colleges rather than keep it with the legislature where it's belong. So when we say, is there a problem in higher education? Absolutely. And who's at the front of that problem? Larry Sequest. All right, so one last question on education. So we talked about K-12, higher ed. Let's go to uh, charter schools. So what are your thoughts on charter schools? Doug, please. I, I, you know, I, I, the jury's out on charter schools. I, I'm a proponent of them, but I'm a proponent of them from this perspective. I think any time we give our parents the opportunity to choose how they're going to educate their child, that's a win. So whether it's charter schools, public schools, private schools, or home schools, or even online learning. I think the more choices out there are better for our kids and for our parents. One of the uh, things that charter schools will bring is an opportunity to look at how do we unregulate the uh, school system. I brought here this book. It's the Common School Manual. Here's all the regulations it takes to run a school. That's a phone book worth of regulations. How do we do this? How do we reform education? Charter schools may not be the silver bullet, but it's an opportunity to start down the path that will give us 
uh, a better education system and ideas on how we can improve what we're already doing. Yeah, I passed out these green sheets. These are all the measures that you're going to be voting on in November. It's two sides, eight measures. The second one, 11, 1240, is the Charter Schools Initiative. And I excerpted for you, because these are complicated issues, uh, what the pros and cons are out of the voters' opinion. Personally, I'm opposed to the charter school ballot. I will vote no on that. But the, what the underlying idea is, is that we need creativity in our schools. Our K-12 system is failing us. We still have about 25% of our students not graduating from high school. Of those who do graduate and come into the higher ed system uh, that I have supervised, the 53% of those kids are not ready. And it's the creativity in that classroom that I'm interested in trying to foster. So let's move from uh, education on to the economy. All right, so this question from an audience member is, doesn't the government have a vital role to play in priming the economic pump and stimulating our faltering economy? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and it, in fact, of the things that the legislature can do, you know, there's every politician in America right now saying, getting up and saying <coughs> say jobs, right? Uh, it doesn't matter what party they belong to, but they're in favor of jobs. The thing that the legislature, the single biggest lever that the legislature has on the state of our economy in this state and in our communities is how we manage education, especially higher education. So I mentioned earlier, we're an undereducated state. Only our 25 year olds are 10% less educated than their parents at a time when our economy is going more and more high tech. We have 60,000 open jobs in this state in the high-tech and aerospace industry, in the biotech industry, and in agriculture, high-tech agriculture. That's what we need to do, is with the legislatures in support for higher education, is turn that spigot on to the max. That's how you do economic growth mm -hmm. in this state. Well, I disagree. I believe that the uh, lever that you have to pull is the lever of the small business community. If you're going to get this economy moving again, 96% of all firms in the state of Washington are small business. If you want to see job creation, let's give it to the people who create jobs, the small business community. Pulling the education uh, lever, while important, is not going to create jobs. What that creates is a highly educated unemployment line. What we need to do is we need to help that small business community get on their feet again, grow, and create the jobs necessary. How do we do that? Through serious reforms, uh, helping uh, provide regulated, regulatory relief, workers' comp, uh, health care, cheap and easy access to health care for our employers. This will allow them to use their hard-earned dollar and grow their company, creating the jobs, getting us back on track again. Thank you. All right, so staying with the economy, this question from the audience member is for both of you. The question is, would you raise taxes next year to balance the budget? And if so, which one? I am not going to raise taxes next year to balance the budget. I refuse to believe that the only way out of this economic mess is to raise taxes. There's too much reform necessary. Just think of it from this perspective. A dollar saved in reform is equal to a dollar raised in taxes. A dollar is a dollar. And so if we can go through our government and we can privatize some areas that we've talked about for years, we've talked about privatizing uh, the print shop, we still haven't done it. We can privatize the workers' comp system. We can reform DOT and some of the issues we got there. Uh, DOE, Department of Health and Social Services. As we move through there and find efficiencies, we can move those dollars to the programs uh, that are important. Raising taxes right now on our hardworking families and on our small business community is not the key to getting out of this recession. It will only compound the problem and it will increase our employment. Thank you. If you notice in my little flyer here that I'm on the record saying we need to realign state spending to the new realities. This economy is not going to grow for a long time. We're at kind of slow speed. I think it's very important that we resize our state government realign it. Give me one simple example that involves Joe. 
His organization, Kids Have Mental Health Services, gets six audits a year from the state by the same people, six different ways, looking at the same set of books. I took him, we went down to DSHS in Olympia and proposed a one 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 audit, one contract, one data set to simplify the way we do business. There are a lot of those things that we can do to realign the way we do state services. And if we do that, we will be able to put money into the education uh, production that we need to fill those jobs that are waiting in this state. All right, staying on the issue of the economy, what state agencies would you like to privatize, if any? Uh, the, the, there are little pieces here. One is that the ferry system, I don't know if you heard me on the radio yesterday morning, uh, on the ferries. The ferry uh, system has about 140, as I understand, it's very hard for them to figure out exactly how many people are working in place, ferry system. But around 140 people who do terminal engineering. That's ordinary civil engineering that could be done by the local engineers and architects. I'd like to see that, for example, moved out. Uh, and what, the thing that I mentioned with Joe, it's not just privatizing, it's real, realigning. We have bulked up in the, the Olympia uh, apparatus, the Olympia organizations. We tend to deliver too much at the state level. I would like to see that move down locally so that local organizations could work together and actually deliver social services much less expensively. Thank you. Uh, I believe I spoke on a couple of them already. Workers' Comp is one that I tackle right away. Uh, the print shop is another one that we can start looking at in civil areas of IT. But I want to come back to the last question, which, which you vote for taxes or not. Did you hear Larry's long story about uh, growth in the middle of management and government and everything? Never once answered the question. Two weeks ago at the editorial board interview with the Kids Epson, he said we we're going to have to offer up a basket of taxes to the community to raise a billion dollars. He also said that he believed in the TNT interview that 1053 is unconstitutional. He is a man who's raised taxes and fees 143 times in the past six years, and he's increased the size of state budget by $6 billion in the last six years. So if he won't answer the question, I'll answer it for him. Yes, Larry likes taxes, and he will raise taxes, and I want that to be clear and out there for the record. Okay, so moving on to small business, this was talked to before about the importance of small business. The question is, help. How can you help small business with a wage structure that includes an entry-level wage, training wage, team wage, and some type of tip credit? Your thoughts, please. How do you report that? It says, how can you help small business with a wage structure that includes an entry level wage, a training wage, a team wage, and some type of tip credit like for servers and waitresses. I apologize on not hearing that years of that fire apparatus with sirens got my right ear, it doesn't work like it used to. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who asked this question and what they're looking for there, uh, but the small business community, there are some struggles. Uh, when I was a kid uh, at age uh, 14, or excuse me, 15, I worked for my uh, dad's business back in the 70s, and I got a nice little, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, minimum wage job, was able to learn some skills and so forth. We've raised minimum wage so high now that uh, it's difficult to bring on some student help or some summer help. And so now we're talking about training wages and teenage wages, and those can be difficult and complicated to navigate. What we need to do is simplify the system, allow for employers to bring um, high school kids on to be able to work within their businesses, to learn the skills of showing work, uh, to work on time, learning what it is to have a checking account, learn what it is to um, uh, work underneath a structured uh, business. Those are the kind of things that we want to encourage in the small business community and within our community as a whole. Uh, I oppose the tip credit itself. This waitress who's taking care of us right now, do you ask her what she thinks of tip credit? It's a way of taking money out of her pocket and putting it someplace else. Okay, so that's a, that's a very bad idea. What is a good idea is that we give our teenagers opportunities to work. Uh, one of the things that I've done is a new CCC, a, it's called the Washington Conservation Corps. You've heard me talk about this before. 
is ways to get young people employed. We created now a, an expansion of the Washington Conservation Corps where young people between 18 and 24 can work for up to two years uh, on teams that do trail building or other kind of saving projects. The important thing, however, is to realize that we need to start this connection between the future work and the school much earlier in our schools. We've got to make sure that our school kids understand the reason they're studying is because there is a career out in front of them. So. <laughs> so, two more questions on the economy. This one is, show us the money. What efficiencies at the state level will you do so that we can expect refunds on our taxes because of a more efficient government? Well, there's not going to be refunds. We're going in. We have a state constitution that requires a balanced budget. And contrary, you know, I'm really astonished just to be one. I've been very careful now in every one of my campaigns, and then we attack the other person to run on the issues. My, as I said, it's this nasty, divisive, angry politics that is a problem with our democracy. I'm trying to run on a, uh, to encourage all of us to participate in this economy, uh, to participate in these politics, to feel like you've got a stake in this, and deliberately to pour acid on this, I take great offense to. That's wrong. That's not good democracy. Thank you. Uh, the question is, show us the money. Show what the efficiencies. Yeah, what efficiencies? <laughs> um, you know, efficiencies in, in government, uh, uh, Larry is absolutely right. You, you're going to try to get tax dollars back from a politician. That's going to be insane down in Olympia. What efficiencies can we talk about to uh, get things going? We talk about reforms and so forth. We can lower the cost of government. We can reduce the size of government. However, um, I want to come to what Larry said, being divisive. It's just not that way, Larry. Larry, just because we can have an open and honest debate about the truth, one of the things that we have in, in politics right now is what we call talking points. And, and Larry seems to have a lot of talking points, but when brought up about his voting record, all of a sudden it's divisive. If we can't have a conversation about what you're for, then, and, and not call it divisive, Larry, then I think that's uh, disingenuous. Uh, my, my concern is this is that if you want to get the economy rolling again, you're going to have to be for small business. I've been endorsed by NFIB, AWB, uh, WRA. I'm for small business. Larry doesn't even vote for small business one out of six times. That's ridiculous. Thank you. So one final question, and actually this is a, uh, a direct question from one of our audience members, and the, uh, again, related to the economy. The uh, audience member says, I am a veteran of Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield, and I don't care about a DD-214. What will you do to help me get a job? Well, as I was just saying, uh, National Federation of Independence has endorsed my platform, Association, uh, excuse me, uh, the uh, Washington Retail Association. Uh, they recognize that the way that we're going to get out of this is to grow our economy. It's simple. We've spent too long the last six years growing our spending by six billion dollars without helping our small business community. If you want a job, you're going to have to help the community or the business community create those jobs. And so what do we do? We're going to fix the workers' comp system. Seven to 28 percent. That's just the rough estimate of what increases may be next year. We're already 3.1 billion dollars underfunded in the workers' comp system our businesses are going to be asked to come up with 19% per year to try to fill that gap. It can't be done. We're going to have to change the way we do business in Olympia. We're going to have to start working to help our small businesses get back on their feet and create the jobs that our working families want. Thank you. Right. Yeah, let's go back to the question about how many vets get employment. The answer is schools. Uh, I just surveyed all of We've got 34 community and technical colleges, six state universities. Right now we've got 17,000 vets with the number growing every month in our community colleges alone. Another 4,000 vets with the new GI Bill studying four-year universities. 
I'm trying to put the pedal to the pedal to increase that. We've got vets coming from all over the country to study in our schools because we have an attractive school environment. And that's the most single important thing we can do is to make sure that we're feeding our businesses. I spend my time talking with the biotech industries, the Microsofts, the Boeings. Our commitment to them as a state is to help them grow by feeding skilled people to them. That's the thing we need to do. Thank you. So staying on that same question is, um, the question comes up, which has been a uh, ongoing discussion in Kitsap County. Do you support a four-year college on the Kitsap Peninsula, and how would you fund such a Well, I didn't support We need to double the entire state's education. As I said earlier, our 25-year-olds are 10% less educated than their parents, and this whole state became about 1.5% less educated, less educated in the last decade. At the time that the Koreans, the Finns, the Europeans are all more educated than we are. Folks, we're in trouble in this society if we cannot, as a group, decide that our kids are going to go to college and graduate. I don't know, they don't have any four-year degrees, but they've got to have a certificate, a skill, something that lets them participate in this modern economy, which keeps changing. Do you know the teachers? The, the, if you're a middle school teacher right now, I was talking to one yesterday, the kids in your classroom do not, the, the jobs that they will fill have not yet been invented, right? Those kids are on a racetrack to try to be skilled enough to participate in that future economy. Thank you. I am a proponent of a four-year college in, in the area. I, I took my four-year degree uh, by traveling all the way to Portland and back and then doing it online. And that can be difficult. And if part of it was for cost. It was cost efficient as far as tuition, which comes back to uh, this extremely high increase in the cost of tuition in the last few years. Uh, another reason was the online learning environment had so much excelled since the early 2000s to 2008, 2009, that made it much easier to achieve that. And so I'm a proponent for finding many ways uh, to get our, our college uh, students a, a high quality degree and a four year degree. However, I want to back up and talk about why are we having such struggle getting kids into school? Well, it's because tuitions have increased. When tuitions have increased from $6,000 to $12,000, you tell me that a hard working family can afford to get their kid into school. It's because we need to try to bring that cost back down within uh, our government and be able to provide more opportunity for our children with educational grants. Thank you. So let's uh, move on to another topic from our audience member who asks, what is your position on fair labor practice and collective bargaining? Uh, this one I'm very familiar with. I, I'm the president of the uh, Firefighters Local, uh, or excuse me, the Battalion Chiefs Local. I was the president of the Firefighters Local when I promoted. I changed locals. Uh, I'm very familiar with F FLSA laws and, and, the, uh, and collective bargaining. I've worked hard to create a uh, fair contract for our organization. Uh, in fact, I'm right in the middle of contract negotiations right now as we speak with our, our labor group and, and the administration. I think it's an important process for, or for firefighters, teachers, police officers who are out there uh, protecting our community. And, I, and I'm proud to say uh, that I've represented them well. Uh, the fights they went to continue to elect me. Uh, and I feel like that I've done a great job in representing the employees of, of my district, or excuse me, of my workplace uh, as their local president. Thank you. A couple of things just for your background information. I, as you would know, I'm always on the work path ferry management and our ferry system has been running a war against its crews. We've got very good crews. So I have been working with our engineers, deck hands, masters and mates to try to improve their lives. Over in the higher education system, we're in the middle of something that will affect you and your pocketbook. The regional universities, so it's not the two research centers, UF, UW and WSU, do not have organized faculty. Their employees, their employees, are organized. But the four regional universities are organized, and Evergreen State College just concluded a bargain with their faculty that begins a pay raise because we have frozen those pay. We, and it's important that we keep quality. 
So the question facing us in the state, including facing you, is how are we going to balance the need to adequately pay high quality faculty with the need to keep our budget in balance? Big so. question coming up. Thank you, sir. Okay, so now let's move on to a, uh, another uh, serious issue for some, many of our audience members. A recent Pew study addressed the issue of the underfunded state pension system. How will you address this issue, Larry? Yeah, actually, I already <coughs> have. I did sit for several years on the pension committee. <coughs> I got started there and overhauled the way we do risk assessment. And very briefly, we've got a, a, a plan one series of plan two, plan three. The oldest first plan was underfunded. After that risk assessment gave us a fresh impression of how risky it was, that's a contract and you have to pay those people who are in that retirement system. We put in $328 million in the last budget to bring our risks down to only a few percent. Uh, and that we will have to continue doing that. So that is a very expensive way of making sure that we meet those commitments. And I'm really pleased to have been part of figuring out what it was we need to do to make sure our pension system is healthy. Thank you. Well, I, th I think that's disingenuous to say that, that he's helped the system. If you Take a look at a card that was written here just a month ago um, from Washington Policy Center. It mimics what the Pew Research was saying uh, nationally. It says that we're $7 billion underfunded in our pension health care. $7 billion to be. We're uh, $2 billion in our TERS and PERS. Uh, another $3.2 billion in our unfunded PERS. And that's all on top of $27 billion of already debt in the state. Our, our pension liabilities uh, and our, our pain for our pensions have been significantly compromised, and they are the white elephant in the room at the state budget level. Last uh, cycle, when you saw four sessions to be able to create a budget, uh, back in uh, in uh, January, or excuse me, in April, we we recognized that every budget that came through offered up skipping a payment to the pension system, and that is unfair to the hardworking people who have contracts that said that we were going to take care of them. We need to fix that pension. So, keep talking about keeping things afloat, um, such as our pension plan, now let's move on to folks. Uh, this goes into the same way. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, the MV, uh, I can't even pronounce the Cheval, Chamoka? Chetsamoka. Yeah, all right. See, that's the reason why these guys are running for office. Okay, cost $80 million <laughs> bill. The same ferry built out of state cost $32 billion. Should build it in Washington, build it in Washington, laws be changed? Uh, absolutely. I think that you need to open up for competition outside. When you look at a, a ferry that was, it was designed was bought from, from uh, Massachusetts, and you look at, uh, it was produced in Mississippi for $32 million roughly, and in our state we, we produced it for about $80 million. It wasn't really, it was about 65 and we had some cost overruns because of some design errors. Um, when you see things like that happen, while I'm not saying that we need to uh, outsource that building of the boat, what I'm saying is we need to bring in outside competition to bid on it so that we can make sure that our Washington boat builders are sharpening their pencil to the lowest it can be because we have an obligation as a legislature to make sure that we're using your tax dollar to the most efficient that it can. Larry has sponsored twice, or tried to put an amendment twice in the transportation funding bill uh, that asked for an additional ferry uh, next cycle. And in that, he wrote in a clause that says it has to be built in Washington, no outside bidding. He is a proponent for staying inside and keeping those costs up. Thank you. And Larry? I'm not sure which legislative record he's leading. I'm actually going to try to kill this little hunger. Uh, the the Chetsuba, you may have, I said, you may have heard me on the radio yesterday or seen the article in the Everett Herald in the last few days. Uh, there have been a bipartisan group of us legislators uh, attacking the ferry system over the cost of this 64 car ferry. Uh, complicated story, but the short answer is to the question 
is that I strongly oppose this building thing. It's your tax money. Why should we send that to some of those states? We've got very good shipyards, union and non-union shipyards. Uh, we've got very good workers in this state. They're quite capable of building and selling competitive ferries and other ships. They do it every day. Uh, our yards are building and selling things every place. We need to keep that money here. What we need to do is get the ferry system out of the building, out of the business of designing the boats. That's where the cost increase came from. Thank you. So saying that transportation, the audience member asks, what can we do, or what can you do as our elected representatives, to improve our transportation system, and how do we pay for it? Now, how do we pay for it is the big question coming up. The business community, Association of Washington Business, our Chamber of Commerce, and they're gathering together right now, and the top priority they've got is that in the next session, the state will start making major investments in transportation. Uh, and I'm working with the other bipartisan members of the Ferry Caucus to try to make sure that as we address the state's transportation needs, that the ferry system is an integral part, that it's not a tech child that has to find its own funding. In order to get there, we've got to make sure that that ferry system is very well managed. So upcoming, there isn't an answer for this yet, is what is the requirement? That's my problem with the enthusiasm for transportation, is I agree we need to spend more money on transportation, but what's the plan? And right now the transportation folks don't have one. So I'm going to stay skeptical until I see the specifics. Thank you. <laughs> well, if you've been out on the highway system, especially when you go down to Highway 16, I-5 corridor, we don't have time to sit and wait, Larry. We have time for action is what we need. We're watching freight mobility and congestion within the I-5 corridor really limit opportunity within our state to garner more business, to grow our economy. If we're going to fix things in transportation, we're going to have to prioritize much more of our money that we put into transportation into congestion relief and into freight mobility instead of into mass transit. We're seeing a high percentage of dollars go into mass transit into the big dig, the Seattle corridor uh, transit uh, authorities. If we're going to spend that money there when 85% of our people are still on the roads on the outside, then it's not going to be effective use of the tax dollar. In order to help the tax dollar be more effective, we're going to have to start focusing on where the congestion and where the issues are. And that's outside the large metropolitan areas. That's going to be what we're going to do to be able to solve some of these congestion issues. Thank you. All right, so let's move, continuing on, the, on that same issue, more specifically for small, I guess, overall businesses. And the question begins, fees, traffic impacts, sewer hookups, et cetera, are dramatically and negatively impacting small business startup. If you support small business growth, will you pledge to reduce these fees? And if so, state specifically by how much and how? I mean, yes. And I'd be happy to reread the question because it is rather complex. So fees, fees are an issue. I brought a, a pamphlet here that we can look at, or we can look up online. It's easy at washingtonfolks.org. Uh, 143 fees that Larry's increased right here. Just go through them every bill that he's signed. Fees are what are killing, it's fees are the new taxes. They're what's killing the small business community. In a recent uh, poll done by the Department of Revenue in our state, they were looking at why are businesses going out? Why are they closing their doors? They found that, that we have the, the second highest uh, closing rate of new business startups. And the reason that they cited in their report was over-regulation and too high of taxes and fees for a new business to start. I am a proponent of reducing those fees, giving regulatory relief to our small business community, and helping them keep their doors open in one of the worst recessions of our lifetime. So you notice that uh Doug here wants to put a lot of money into pensions, wants to put a lot of money into roads, he's going to fund education first. I think there's a math problem there someplace. The fees that increased 
that went into that fee package are what got us the new 144 fares. We went through and changed a bunch of fees that had been changed in a long time in order to build two more ferries. If you want to get from Bremerton to Seattle, you need new ferry service. We've got a ferry system that is hanging on by its fingernails. We need new boats. I would like to see those boats built much, built much less expensively uh, without the ferry system meddling in that. And I got Brian Sontag to launch a major audit of how they're doing that. But that's what we need to see is that those, those fees are turned into something productive. And in this case, it's two new ferries. So let's move on to another issue that is a great major concern to many of our audience members, and it simply is, what is, um, the question is, how do you feel about a state income tax? So I guess the question is, do you believe in supporting a state income tax that results in the budgetary issues? This gets back to the basket question that uh, was misrepresented a few minutes ago. Uh, if I oppose a, 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 an income tax, what I'm in favor of and have been for the first day that I started running six years ago is a comprehensive tax reform. We've got a bad tax system. Our B&O tax is bad for business. Our sales tax system is highly regressive. Our property tax does not meet the constitutional requirement for a balanced effect on education around the state. We need to rethink the whole package. Unfortunately, you folks and the legislature and your colleagues around the state aren't there yet. You apparently are not ready for that conversation. We need to have that. I would like to have that conversation about tax reform right now. In the meantime, back to this pledge question, I don't pledge anything. I refuse to sign any pledges. I am, am being sent, elected to go down and exercise judgment not to pre, you know, to fall some kind of preset commitment. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm committed to the community to not institute an income tax. Uh, an income tax is not going to solve our problems. For six years now, we've heard uh, from my opponent that we need more money, more money, more taxes, more fees, to the tune of $6 billion. What people may not know in this room is Mr. Seaquist sits on the House Ways and Means Committee. What is the House Ways and Means Committee? It's the Budget Budget Committee. When you see $6 billion increase in the last six years, he's the man who was sitting in the room creating that budget. When he talks about not funding enough money to education and having cuts to higher ed, he's the one that wrote those budgets. When you talk about underfunding the pension system, he's the one that underfunded them. You know, it's disingenuous for him to stand up here to talk about how he's fought to uh, improve the situation when he's the one that not only created the situation, then you folks to raise those taxes and fees. We can't do that any longer. We need new leadership. And this is getting near one of the last questions, and it actually has to do with how do we get those fees if, uh, and revenues. The question is, with 1053 set to expire this coming session, would you vote to uphold a two-third majority for tax increase? I would. I, I believe that the people have spoken, especially in our district. If you think about it, 70%, 69.2% of the uh, 26th district voted to ensure that we had taxpayer protection from people who like to raise taxes like my home. We have to protect uh, our community and our small business community, our hardworking families from uh, just everyday tax increases and fee increases. This is not the time in our economy to be putting more burdens on those hardworking families. When they're struggling to keep their kids in college, when they're struggling to put food on the table, as we see the inflationary costs of food and gas around the community, now is not the time. And I will uh, sign the two-thirds majority for 1185, and I will vote next year to protect 1053 if it comes to the floor. Thank you. So again, back to the green sheet. This is the top uh, issue on the front, front cover, the 1185 measure. I strongly oppose that as I have every time the Tim I has put this thing up. It's bad government. It is expensive for you. It costs you money. It makes government much less efficient. And it's something that we should not accept. I actually believe it's unconstitutional. There is a court case that's working its way 
toward the Supreme, it's after the Supreme Court right now to make a ruling on that. I'm hoping that happens this summer uh, before the next session. Uh, I want to remind you of something that uh, uh, what you've been hearing here is absolutely backwards about my fiscal record in the legislature. Everybody knows that I am the most fiscally conservative Democrat they ever met. Everybody knows that I have been voting against taxes and have been an obstacle in my own party to what we were actually proposing for revenue. Everybody knows that. That's on the record, and it's on the voting record. Thank you, Larry. So that brings us to the end of our question and answer period. So now we move into conclusion or summary remarks from our candidates. Candidates get a full two minutes to readdress questions or restate issues or whatever they choose. This is their two minutes to address you as the audience in full. We started this morning with Doug. We'd like to conclude with Larry starting for two minutes, please. Two points. One, I make, want to make sure that you, I, I doubt that you have any doubt in your own minds about the differences between us here. But the important single difference that I can hear here is my approach to where do we go next? In my view, we have got to put the pedal to the metal on education. We've got to make our K-12 system work better, put additional money into early learning, and where I work, especially accelerate the higher education system. The future of our state depends upon our ability for more of us to become more skilled and fill those tens of thousands of jobs that our companies are building ready for us. Second point, I started out by telling you, why do I get all fired up about this? And yeah, no, I enjoy even these kinds of uh, sharp debates. Uh, this is good democracy for us. And I'm looking forward, I'm hoping that you're looking forward to, to staying involved. I'd like to thank my campaign team and all the volunteers who work with us. Uh, there are a lot of these debates coming up and I hope you will plan to join us. Uh, this, this, it's important that we try to move to the place where we as a people are enjoying our politics even across the things where we differ. We're at a place now in our society where we have got to restore to ourselves the ability to work together. That's the kind of politics that I'm trying to practice now. That's the kind of campaign we need to have to get us from here to November. Thank you very much. And, uh, well, I do thank you for coming out this morning, and I appreciate the opportunity to share with you two very differing ideas on where we go from here. Uh, Larry wants to put the pedal to the metal on higher education. I want to focus on job creation, getting our small business community going again. You know, I find it uh, 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 amusing that he's a self-proclaimed fiscal hawk. He says, everybody knows. Well, how do we check into that? As a voter, I'm asking that you check into that. How do we check into that? You look at his voting record. How do you, how do you check in the, to someone's self-proclaimed fiscal responsibility? You check into it by looking up Washington State. Um, uh, you can look at the Washington um, uh, votes.org. You can see right here. I'll leave this here if anyone wants to take it. It's right off of there. It's 143 times he's raised taxes and fees on our small businesses in our community and our, our hardworking families. You know, you want to find out how much the budget's raised, go to OFM and look at it. In 2006, when he took office, it was 25 million, or excuse me, billion is what our biennium budget was. It's over 31 billion now. That's six billion dollars. I'm not making this up. These are just the facts. We don't have to get hot and heated about it. It's just the truth of the matter. And that's what's important is we talk about the truth. Because if we want to get out of the situation we're in, we have to acknowledge that we've been doing it the wrong way for too long. We cannot continue doing the same status quo in Olympia. We want to talk about bipartisanship. In a recent uh, Kitsap County uh, blog, uh, they, they determined that Larry only breaks from his party 4% of the time. That's only seven votes in his, in his six year career that he broke from his party. And that's right in the Kitsap Sun if you want to look it up. So what I'm asking, is you make a choice, a choice between moving in a new direction or staying on the same path that has put us into this debt and this whole world. Thank you. I'm Doug Richards, and I appreciate your vote.